Welcome everybody. Uh, hopefully you've been able to uh, log in fine to this exciting afternoon session on improving and understanding policy with machine learning and natural language processing. Uh, we've got a set of three talks um, which cover a good range of central bank policy and how we might address some of the challenges in it with um, techniques that are from the frontier of data science. Now, normally I'd be directing you to the fire exits. Uh, clearly, that's not going to be uh, necessary in this case, but I do have a few other notes just uh, as we begin. So all presenters are going to have 20 minutes uh, to present and then 10 minutes uh, for Q&A at the end of each talk. If you have a question for a presenter, please use the Q&A button, uh, button, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if I invite you to ask a question, your mic will be unmuted so that you can uh, ask it. And then please uh, introduce yourself with your uh, name and affiliation. Uh, just to note that the talks are being recorded and will be made available later. We've got a hard cut off at the end of the session, so we really do have to keep to time. And uh, just a quick ad break, I've been asked to tell you uh, that there is another conference that you might enjoy if you like this session uh, called Big Data and Machine Learning, uh, Measuring Economic Stability, run by the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve and King's College London. And um, the deadline for submissions to that, which is, uh, is the 21st of September, it's held in November virtually, and you can find more details on the Bank of England website. Okay, well, without further ado, let's have our first speaker, Joel Suss from the Bank of England. Uh, Joel, you have 20 minutes to speak and 10 minutes for Q&A. Thank you. Okay, just sharing my screen. Thanks, uh, thanks, Arthur. Thanks uh, for that introduction. And uh, uh, I'm very happy to be presenting this piece of work here at this conference. Uh, put it in presentation mode first. So my name is uh, Joel Suss. I'm a research data scientist at the Bank of England. And I'll be presenting this work on predicting bank distress in the UK. So just the, the regular disclaimer first that the views expressed by me here are my own and not necessarily those of the Bank of England or its committees. So first, uh, I'll get right into uh, the presentation at, with an overview. Um, so the work here is uh, published as a staff working paper, myself and a colleague at the Bank of England, Henry Tritel, last year. And basically what we wanna do, what we, what we tried to do was uh, build a practically useful early warning system of bank distress for the UK. So uh, we, we want something that can be actually used by bank supervisors at the, at the Bank of England. So there's really three criteria at which we uh, focus on. Uh, the first one, obviously performance, a practically useful early warning system has to perform well, has to be accurate in some sense. And so we conduct a, a horse race. We compare a number of different predictive models and you know, for the interest of, of selecting the, the best performing one. Secondly, and this is a, a critique of machine learning models as being a black box, as being opaque. Um, you know, this is a big problem for users, such as potentially bank supervisors who, who want to use the you know, machine learning model to uh, make predictions. And it needs to be transparent enough for them to understand what is driving predictions, because they can then influence um, you know, the, the input variables uh, for those models. So transparency is very important. And finally, and this one is actually um, some uh, work that we're doing now, so it doesn't, doesn't constitute part of the staff working paper. Uh, the third criteria though is uh, comprehensiveness. So this is really about incorporating a broader range of data uh, than is typical, than we, than we did actually in our staff working paper. We use balance sheet and financial statements and typically models are built on financial data, but really there's, there's a, uh, you know, it's clear that non-financial data, data that relates to organizational culture, management and governance, operational resilience, is very important for anticipating uh, distress and is something that Bank of England supervisors uh, pay attention to. So we, we wanted to incorporate uh, this kind of data, you know, to really get to a practically useful uh, early warning system model. So, that's the uh, criteria around which we're going to structure our research. So, okay, the data. So now, uh, you know, we have a, a problem. A problem 
in quotation marks, it's not a real problem, but it's a problem for building an early warning system in the UK context. Really, there's not enough failures uh, to build, to construct a model in the UK in recent years. So we need to think of a different outcome measure to use. Um, at the same time, we uh, regulate a, a lot of uh, different types of firms, small to large, uh, credit unions, building societies, uh, universal banks. And uh, a lot of these firms don't have market data uh, as an alternative outcome measure. They don't have data uh, for, you know, they're not publicly listed. They don't have debt instruments traded in the market. So we, don't, we can't uh, use this kind of data to construct an outcome measure. So this is a problem from, you know, the perspective of building a, a practically useful uh, model for uh, the UK context of regulated banks. So what's our solution? Um, we uh, use data that is basically labels given to firms. Uh, uh, the riskiness uh, of a firm is judged by supervisors, and we use those labels uh, to construct an outcome measure. Um, so we, we take uh, the ARO total probability score, which is uh, the Financial Services Authority era um, supervisory assessments of, of bank risk, so from 2006 to 2012. Um, and we actually dichotomize this, uh, it's a scale of one to 10 with 10 being the highest risk. We dichotomize this eight or above, we consider a bank to be in distress. Uh, at eight, you are already considered a high risk firm. So the top three notches were high risk. So any firm that's high risk, we consider to be, uh, we label as distressed. Um, and the figure here on the right shows the quarterly distributions of those scores. And so obviously there's a, there's a inflation of risk scores as the financial crisis hits and a persistence of the scores uh you know this is potentially due to the euro crisis uh you know creating a lot of uncertainty from the financial crisis and then the euro crisis as well um so there's you know potentially uh well you know i said this is the lack of traditional outcome measures is a bit of a problem but actually if you think about the potential end users of an early warning system being bank regulators actually having an outcome measure which is uh, more aligned with how they uh, judge firms is, is actually potentially uh, you know advantageous so uh, that's that's the the uh, score we use secondly actually we also use uh, an objective measure of bank risk that's based on a uh, balance sheet financial statement variable so the z score or distance to default measure so that's uh, uh, calculated based on return on assets and equity ratios and the standard deviation of return on assets using a 16 quarter window. So that's a, a sort of robustness, uh, robustness outcome measure that we use to also uh, uh, you know, help us construct models of uh, distress. So uh, moving on now to the input data, the predictors. So what do we use here? So uh, as I said at the beginning, the staff working paper uh, basing this talk off of just used financial data. So firstly, financial ratios from uh, a specific data set compiled here at the Bank of England, the Historical Bank Regulatory Database, regulatory returns. So uh, this is balance sheet and financial statements for uh, regulated firms on a quarterly basis. We take a number of uh, financial ratios that fit broadly into the kind of classic CAMELS uh, categorization scheme. So capital, asset quality, management, earnings, liquidity, sensitivity to market risk. Uh, we also uh, compute some growth rates. So how are financials and uh, you know, balance sheet items, assets, equity changing? So year on year growth rates. And uh, we also include macroeconomic variables. So these are UK focused year on year changes. So just a, a quick note on you know, how, do we, how do we get down to our, our final set of variables. We started with 55. We chose these from um, you know, previous research. Uh, variables that were, were seen to be uh, found to be important uh, and as well as some subject matter expertise, some help uh, internally from people uh, who are, uh, you know, targeting, looking at uh, firms and, and, and following different variables. So we had an initial set of 55, we, we whittled it down to 32 following, uh, you know, um, dropping some for poor coverage during the period or because of uh, multicollinearity where we fit a, a linear regression and, and we calculated the variance inflation factors and drop some variables because of that. So we had a final set of 32 variables. In our data set, uh, 170 banks and just over 3,000 observations total. And just to, uh, yeah, and our, our base model is early warning system. We thought as, as our base, we would be predicting distress a year 
out. So we lagged our predictors by four quarters in the base months. Okay, so we wanted to compare, we want to basically select a model which performs best in some sense, performs better than alternatives. So we compared six different models. The first two are sort of classic statistical uh, linear models, uh, the pooled logistic regression, random effects regression, which accounts for the uh, clustering structure, the, the grouping in the data. And then four that fall under the kind of machine learning umbrella. So a k-nearest neighbors algorithm, a random forest, uh, boosted classification trees. So th these, these two are, are ensembles of uh, classification trees, different kinds of ensembles, and then a support vector machine. So these are the models that we uh, compared. Uh, now, uh, uh, just to explain how we estimated performance. So uh, all estimates of, of performance were out of sample. We, we had sort of two approaches to doing this. Um, the first one was uh, what we call double block randomization. So basically because of the structure of the data, we had uh, uh, repeated measurements of firms over time. Um, we, we sampled, um, we didn't sample, um, you know, exclude randomly observations uh, in a simple way, because then you might have an observation from the same firm in, in both the training and, and test it or from the same quarter. So we, we block randomize first by quarter um, and then by firm. And so uh, really what we have in our test out of sample uh, set is uh, firms and quarter observations which are unseen by the data used to train the models. So this, uh, on the right, this uh, diagram is a bit convoluted, but basically that, that's, that's what it explains. We, we end up with uh, a test set where we evaluate our models on, uh, which is unseen uh, firms and quarters. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, we uh, also did a rolling window forecast. So we also evaluate our, our, our performance on, on, a, on a out of time um, test set. So we uh, train on, on the first uh, eight uh, quarters and then uh, evaluate on the next four quarter horizon. Um, so we did both of these things. And, and just as a way of sort of um, not, not, not having uh, optimistic model uh, performance, but making sure there's, there's, we minimize our sources of data leakage. Um, so now in terms of the performance evaluation, so we looked at a number of different metrics. There's actually no sort of um, you know, best metric to kind of look at when evaluating these different models, but actually in our context, um, uh, certain metrics are more important than others potentially. So we looked at three actually. So the ranking ability, so this is the sort of classic area under the, on the curve. Um, and, and really it, it gives a sense of, of how good each model is at ranking a case of distress versus non-distress correctly. Um, and so that's the, the figure on the bottom left. And we find the, uh, so, you know, the, the better ranking ability, the higher the proportion of correctly ranking, um, we find the random forest uh, performs the best under that criteria. Um, secondly, and this is, you know, perhaps more important in a kind of regulatory context where the actual um, predicted probability, the number that the model spits out has some informational content is, is important from a regulatory uh, perspective. Is it 95 versus 90 versus 85? Um, uh, so, so, you know, what the number is, is, is potentially uh, relevant. So we also uh, looked at, we, we, we had a measure of the quality of those uh, probabilities uh, using the Breyer score. So this is basically the uh, mean square difference between the predicted probability and the actual outcome. So uh, the higher the score, the worse. Uh, off. So uh, again, the random forest on this metric, this is the bottom right figure, uh, performed the best relative to the other models. And finally, um, also uh, from sort of a regulatory perspective, we care more about false negative errors. So uh, missing cases of distress, the model um, makes a prediction and says uh, this bank is going to be fine. It turns out to be incorrect. The bank is in distress in the future. That's that's pretty uh, that's that's a bad error relative to uh, a false positive where uh, the model predicts that the bank is going to be in distress and it's not. So so really, there's an asymmetric uh, asymmetrical um, uh, uh, value by regulators put onto these different errors. So we also look at false negative errors, 
uh, and that's this figure here. And so the picture here is a, a bit more uh, messy. It, not, not, there's, there's no model that dominates. So this figure shows uh, on the x-axis the threshold at which uh, a firm is categorized uh, as uh, distressed, over which is categorized as distressed, and the y-axis is the false negative error rate. And so actually the random forest is, is performing best uh, at a, at a threshold of 50% uh, or below, and otherwise is uh, actually performing worse. So, um, you know, this is sort of complicating our picture, but if you think about um, from a regulatory perspective, minimizing false negative errors, you can imagine, uh, you know, sort of errors above 25% or 20% or is, is sort of intolerable. So our threshold uh, should be set below, uh, below a point at which you, you have a sort of maximum of uh, you know, 20 percent false negative error rate. Uh, and so if you look at, the, uh, at this figure, um, at low false negative rates, actually at any threshold, you know, at, at below a 20 percent rate, at any threshold, the random forest actually dominates. So again, here we have, um, you know, from, from the pers perspective of our research, we have, we have evidence that the random forest seems to be performing uh, better than the other models evaluated. So that's, that's performance. Uh, the second criteria, transparency. So the black box critique, uh, the, the opacity of machine learning models uh, for understanding what's driving predictions is, is pretty important from a regulatory perspective. Because as I said at the beginning, predictions uh, need to be actionable. Uh, there's mitigating action taken uh, potentially in response to uh, different predictions. So we spent a, a quite a lot of time in our research to sort of uh, help understand what was driving these, uh, you know, the predictions of the random forest algorithm. Um, and we looked at uh, shapely values, um, sort of a state-of-the-art interpretability technique. So basically with shapely values, you can understand um, what are driving individual predictions? So on a sort of case by case basis, what are the variables which, which, which are, are making up uh, the prediction? And you can also from, from those uh, observation level uh, um, uh, decompositions, you could also uh, derive measures of global variable importance. And then uh, following some work from, from a colleague, Andy Joseph here, we also uh, ran some shapely regressions, which is to, do, to, to run some sort of uh, statistical tests of significance on these variables. And, uh, and to get a better understanding, because our, our random forest is able to pick up uh, non-linearities and, and, and automatically uh, accounts for uh, interactions, we, we could also get a sense of how different variables are working together. So we, we have measures of interaction strength. So I'll just show you um, what the variable, the global variable importance from the shapely values. Uh, we took the mean absolute shapely value per observation, normalized this so the uh, values uh, sum to one uh, to get a sense of relative importance of, of different variables. So the top uh, two, so actually the three out of the top five variables are macro variables. So uh, the top one is uh, UK earnings change. So uh, a measure of average real earnings in the, uh, in the UK. And uh, the second is inflation. So these were the most important variables. The UK earnings the most uh, by, by a long way. And then uh, size as number three. So this really sort of, you know, thinking about the period of study, 2006 to 2012, this really, you know, uh, sort of makes sense. Uh, bigger firms, more interconnected firms uh, ran into um, problems. Uh, and, you know, this was a very macro kind of uh, you know, shock, uh, you know, that, uh, that uh, reverberated through the financial system. Um, so anyhow, this is this is just to show that we um, we can um, peer through the machine learning black box relatively well. Okay, finally, and this is this sort of extension work. So um, a criteria of uh, you know evaluation is is you know we we have good performing models relative to others, but uh, you know you also want to think of sort of absolute performance and can we um, do better. Um, by including other data, and typically data that's included in these kinds of uh, machine models is, is, as I said, financial only. Uh, and, and really, we want to introduce data which is known to be important by bank regulators, um, um, 
but hasn't yet been included in model build. So we introduced non-financial predictors around culture, management and governance, operational resilience. Uh, we had a bit of a mismatch. The data for these uh, you know, categories uh, only uh, begin in 2014, so after our period of study. So we had this data from 2014 to the present. So we, we also didn't have the same outcome measure that we used in our, in our study. So we used the Z score as I introduced earlier. Um, I won't go through this in detail, um, but these are all the kind of variables which we included around customer complaints, data quality metrics, um, diversity of senior management and board, uh, tenure of senior management and board, and um, some uh, notes on uh, some, some reports on, on uh, risk uh, skilled person reports. So uh, just highlight a few here. Complaints close slowly, average numbers of days that uh, firms report late to regulatory returns, the, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the proportion of women on the uh, board, uh, tenure of non-executive directors, and, and so on and so forth. So we added all these into models. I'll just quickly show you the results. So we, we looked at, um, uh, so we looked at, you know, because the Z-score is a continuous outcome measure, we looked at two uh, typical uh, metrics and, um, the purple cross shows the performance for the full model, including financial and non-financial data. And we find uh, that actually performs best at all different horizons from one to four quarters. So yes, um, introducing non-financial data is uh, very valuable and, and definitely is better than, than just financial data alone. Um, and here is the um, Shapely, the, the global variable importance Shapely values again inclusive of the uh, non-financial data, and those are highlighted in red. So again, um, these are quite important, actually, is what, is what we find. Uh, so, so I'll just conclude. Um, so uh, we, in our, in our staff working paper, found the random forest to be the, the best performing model on, on a number of different uh, metrics. We used uh, shapely values to peer through the uh, machine learning black box, and we uh, are, you know, and then as a follow-on research, introduced non-financial data into the picture and find that we improve performance. Uh, of course, you know, uh, there's some limitations here. Uh, you know, the models can only um, learn from data that, that uh, it has and, and sort of, you know, black swan events, COVID-19 uh, experiences, which, which have no precedence in, in the data we build our models on is, is, is obviously kind of, um, uh, you know, problematic from, from a, a well-functioning model. So, so that's, that's like sort of constant limitation. And, and clearly there's, there's tons more data that we, um, you know, that supervisors, uh, market observers look at when evaluating firms and, and we have, you know, uh, only scratched the surface for including this, these, this kind, of, kind of data. So uh, thanks very much for listening and uh, happy, very happy for your questions. Uh, thanks a lot, Joel. Uh, so we've, we've got about seven minutes now to Let's see that um, Anna Galvao has um, asked one in the comments. So Anna, if you could come in and, and just ask that. Uh, hi, it's just that, uh, can you show the slide that you have the, um, the proportions for each variable? Uh, that, that you have uh, macro variables, not this one, the previous one. Okay, my comment on that is that not only you have macro variables are having largest contribution, as the ones that have largest contribution are more persistent variables than the other ones now. Is that right? So you, you need something that has very persistent variation on time in comparison to things that are more volatile. Uh, yes, like the size would be yeah the obvious uh, one as well. As yeah, I'm just wondering that if there is something on the machine learning that's biased towards this, or is just the characteristic of the variable we try to explain, which is the distress that's concentrating some specific points in time, or if it's the machine learning that kind of pick up only these variables that are very persistent and gives less weight to variables that are very volatile. So I, I, I don't, uh, I think the, um, the fact that size was, was you know, I think if you run a linear regression model, also size would be pretty, uh, you know, important uh, factor for explaining uh, so the riskiness. So, um, yeah. So it, I don't think it has to do with persistence, but rather that that that, that bigger banks were ended up being uh, more problematic. Um, you know, and, and the same could be said about the macro variables. Yeah, because the size is not changing over time, right? Mm. Okay. Yeah, it, it doesn't change over time, but you know, I, I think regardless of the time period, um, the larger firms would have would have been considered riskier. I think is is is, is maybe uh, 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, anyone else who would like to uh, ask a question, remember to use the Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, while there aren't any up there uh, this second, Joel, I was just going to ask you a related question about what kind of feature engineering uh, you did for these variables, because for some models, uh, particularly things like support vector, uh, that, that can have a big effect and also in fact, normalization can uh, in, uh, can be a problematic for the out of sample testing when you've got a really complicated out of sample setup like you've got here. So, can you say a little bit about that? Yeah. So, for for you know the models where um, you know the sort of uh, the scaling uh, potentially matters, um, all variables were scaled. Um, so, uh, mean equal to zero, standard deviation equal to one. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's 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 how that was. Out. So, k nearest neighbors is, is another example of of where scaling um, was it was important to do to the to the variables and do you cut the data set according to the um sampling that you're doing before you do the scaling or is the scaling over the entire sample right oh yes that's it. so yeah so a potential another source of data leakage so the scaling happened at the uh at the point um of of you know so it didn't happen beforehand but it, it was it was constantly rescaled as as the sort of procedure uh, happened Okay. Um, let's see how we're doing for time. We've got a few more minutes. Um, anyone else want to ask anything? Um, so I have another question, which is you said that these uh, softer measures uh, did seem important. Uh, what softer measure didn't you manage to get hold of that you would like to have in the ideal world uh, that you think might boost performance, if you can speculate? Yeah, so actually, I mean, I'm, I'm still, working on getting some further data sort of on stream here. Um, so recently actually, and have not been able to include this yet, um, still a lot of cleaning to do, but um, data on whistleblowing. Um, so we uh, ourselves, the, the Bank of England and, and the FCA um, have uh, uh, important uh, whistleblowing sort of, you know, we are sort of a port of call for whistleblowers. And so we have information on, on the, the number of, of you know, it referrals uh, by whistleblowers and the sort of severity of, you know, the conclusion of those kind of referrals. So, that, so I think that really um, potentially sheds light on the kind of culture of integrity um, for different firms. So we're just getting that on stream now. Um, and also data on remuneration, variable remuneration and, and how, uh, you know, sort of the CRO in a firm, how much uh, that individual is getting paid relative to uh, other executives, um, you know, potentially gives a sort of insight on, on how important the risk function is, is the sort of stature of the risk function in an organization. So um, we'd love to uh, get that kind of data uh, as well. I mean, it exists. It's just sort of hard to, um, to sort of get uh, and clean. So um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully in the future. Yeah, that sounds brilliant. Um, I think we just have time for one last quick question uh, from Adrian Ham about, um, do you want to state it yourself, Adrian? Yes, if the technology is going to work, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah. It, I was just talking about um, explaining individual decisions because obviously you're talking about, you know, this perceived kind of black box um, uh, nature of, of some models. And, and you, you kind of looked at kind of global factors that sometimes people also think about, well, how would I explain an individual decision? How would you explain a decision to a, to a particular bank that you're making an intervention with? And those might not necessarily um, be influenced by all those global factors maybe they might be but but maybe they might not be have, have you given any thoughts to those those explanations of individual decisions yeah yeah I mean, that's, a, that's a great point i think you know for, in, in terms of sort of productionizing this kind of model you know the sort of individual predictions are are more relevant um the globals is potentially not um you know that that important to look at um so actually the shifting values are uh, uh observation level um decomposition so actually it is uh at, at its, you know it, it does provide that kind of individual case by case uh decomposition and so really this graph that, that you see on the slide is, is taking those individual decompositions and aggregating them up to a global level so uh yeah the shapely values are are very uh useful for individual level predictions great th thanks should, should i i'll stop sharing now uh, we need to make room for Al Farrell, who is also a colleague of mine 
at the Bank of England. Um, Al, are you on? Great. I am. Hi. Same test up to 20 minutes uh, for talk, and if you can try and leave 10 minutes uh, for, for questions at the end. Thanks, Al. Sure. Thanks, Arthur. So we should hopefully be seeing some slides on screen. Um, my name is Al Firrell, and I'm a data scientist in the advanced analytics team at the Bank of England. Um, and I'm going to be presenting a paper uh, written with my colleague Kate Reynolds, um, looking at how macroeconomic uncertainty affects voting um, on the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee, the MPC. Uh, this is going to be shortly published, uh, or shortly going to be published uh, in the Bank of England staff working paper series. Uh, so we'll kick off with an overview of the motivation and the method and the results, and then we'll dig into the detail. So we all know there's been a lot of macro uncertainty in recent years. Um, and there's a lot of media focus on voting patterns of uh, decision making committees, um, particularly as an indicator of certainty or an uncertainty. But is this really reasonable? Um, disagreement is a natural part of committee behaviour, um, and policymakers have a lot of uh, different incoming data um, that they have to extract a signal from. Um, Various previous papers have shown that uh, policymakers' views of economic conditions of the state of the economy form an important part of that. And so in this paper, we want to understand the effects of those views. So their estimates of the state of the economy, um, the effects on voting under different levels of macro uncertainties um, to see whether we should expect uh, their voting records to change um, during those times. However, unlike votes, these views are not directly observable. So how do we go? We firstly set up a um, member voting model as a signal extraction problem um, to estimate the true state of the economy. Uh, members have various inputs, um, all with noise, including the views of other committee members. As we can't directly observe votes, instead we need to construct a measure. And we do this using text analysis on members' speeches to gather their individual views and on the minutes of MPC meetings to gather a co collective sentiment. And using these measures, we explore the impact on votes and how these might change during periods of high uncertainty. Looking at the main results before we dig into the detail, we find that uh, both individual economic assessments and broader committee views are important in explaining committee voting. But we also see that during times of high uncertainty, both of those carry less weight. Uh, so both are downweighted compared to other factors, with individual views downweighted even more. So members are less likely to push their own view over others. And additionally, under times of high uncertainty, um, while the estimates of the state of the economy become more volatile, um, we see that dispersion in those views uh, does not become more volatile, it's no, it's no bigger, and so the rate of dissenting votes is not changed. Um, and all this means is that uh, interpreting votes as a record of a uh, reflection of uncertainty, of policy uncertainty, is pretty unreliable. Um, votes can only tell us so much, and it really highlights the value of individual members' communications as an alternative mechanism for conveying those differences in view. So I'll take you through the model that I talked about and some simulations, um, how we derived the measures from the speeches and minutes, and uh, finally the empirical analysis that brings those results out. Um, there's a slide here as well for those later who would like to look at related literature. So before we go into the model, for those who are not so familiar with the MPC, here's a little quick summary. Um, there are nine members on the MPC, um, and voting for bank rate or alternative monetary measures is by majority. Um, after every meeting, those votes are published. So they're publicly attributed. Um, we can see the full historical voting record on the Bank of England website. Minutes are also published, but those are not attributed. So comments and discussions are not named, nor do we have an attributed forecast, just a best collective judgment. Um, members are, however, required to explain their views, so they do this through other public statements, so speeches, interviews, and such like. 
So the model we set up is, as I say, about signal and extraction. Policymaker receives noisy signals of the true state of the economy. That's uh, ST here. Um, and they observe their own signals and they observe signals of other committee members as well with extra noise. Um, depending on the signal to noise ratio, each of those is weighted. So the stronger the signal, the higher the weight. Um, the estimate of that state of the economy is mapped into a, a sort of simple policy rule. Um, but also it's not entirely smooth. So we've got things like voting is done in quarter of a percentage point steps, 25 basis point steps. Um, other studies have um, noted that there's a sort of desire for consensus and dissent only kind of really kicks in if there's a sufficiently diff large difference in views. So there's maybe a sort of inaction period before that. So we're talking about uncertainty. I guess for a policymaker, uncertainty can come from volatility in actual real underlying economic conditions, or it can come from periods where it's just harder to get a signal about the true state of the economy. So this economy may or may be more or less volatile, but it's actually a period where it's harder for the um, policymaker to, to understand that. Um, so we take this model and we set up um, some simulations to try out these different types of uncertainty. Um, the model is baselined on actual historical data. Um, and then we set up different calibrations that raise either the volatility of the state of the economy or of the signal. And we look at the effects. And here's what we see. Um, so we're looking here at the proportion of dissenting votes. So the number out of nine members who vote against the majority. So your maximum here is four out of nine. Um, so the green, pink and orange lines represent different calibrations of uncertainty. So green doubles the variance in the estimates of the state of the economy. Uh, pink doubles the variance in the signal. And orange also doubles the variance in the signal, but increases the signal to noise ratio of other members' signals. Um, and so basically what we see here is that the source of uncertainty really matters um, in terms of how much the level of dissent kicks in. The green lines and the orange lines are pretty much as much or even less dissent than the baseline. Um, so green, we have variation in the estimates of the state, but no actual change to dispersion of policymakers' views, so no more dissent. Uh, in B, we see a whole bunch more um, dissent. So the variation in the signal leads to much more dispersion in views and therefore more dissent. But in the orange line, that is dampened again. That's downweighted um, because policymakers effectively aren't trusting their own view relative to others. So they're moving towards a consensus. So we've got three types of uncertainty and each one raises the, uh, uh, the variance in the estimate of the true state, but may lead to higher or lower or unchanged dispersion in votes. So taking this simulation, we can set up a regression um, of this, this estimate of the state, the sentiment, I'll call it later, um, against votes. Um, and we'll use this whole same regression later on um, with real sentiment data that we've gathered from speeches and minutes. So what we're looking at here is change in, um, in vote. So using one for tighter, minus one for looser, or zero for no change. Um, and in here we have uh, the individual's own sentiment about changes to the state of the economy, and the average over all the members. So that's an MPC-wide or committee-wide sentiment. Um, and in each case, we've got an interaction with this UH term, so that's a dummy for high uncertainty periods. Um, so we can see both the uh, sentiments on their own and the interactions with uncertainty. And in terms of what we find the model predicting, we're getting from the top two lines that individual and committee views are both positively associated with votes. From the second two lines, we're also seeing that in periods of high uncertainty, irrespective of the calibration, by the way, I'm showing calibration B, but this is across all three, um, high uncertainty causes a negative effect on both of those things. So they're downweighting the importance of the individual and the MPC sentiment in terms of the impact on votes. Um, and yeah, from the previous slide, we pretty much saw that the implication for the dispersion of views and the dissent depends on the source of the uncertainty. So it could be higher or lower or unchanged. 
So I'd like to go into now, how do we actually extract this sentiment from minutes and text? We've got a couple of communications that we can analyze, given that we can't get this information from votes. The minutes are very formal, they're well structured, they come out on a regular basis, eight times a year, it used to be monthly, um, but they're not attributed, so we can't get individual sentiment from them. Speeches on the other hand are entirely personal, so entirely attributed, um, but they're very varied, they're very varied in language, in their structure, uh, in the topic even, and they're irregular in timing. So the combination we can use to try and get individual and committee views. In order to do this, we're looking to try and extract from the text of these items um, the change in hawkishness or dovishness, so uh, predilection for a title or looser policy, um, when they're discussing economic topics. And following some other papers, we do this by creating a dictionary of um, central bank terms that would indicate hawkishness or dovishness. But unlike some others, we do this in bigrams. So we take a key economic term, so say inflation, unemployment, and then we look for a change in level indicator, so rising, falling, increasing, dropping. And we look for evidence of those bigrams in the text. The overall procedure is pretty much as shown. So we clean the text, we count the instances of the bigrams, and then we count an index which subtracts hawkish from dovish over the total to give us a kind of net hawkishness index. And this is the number we're going to use for our sentiment scores throughout. I'll take you through a little example of this on a small snippet of text. So here's a small snippet from May 2016 minutes. So firstly, we're going to clean down the text. And that'll mean stemming words so that, say, increasing increases increased all turn to the same uh, root word. We're going to get rid of intervening stop words, which don't uh, help us out here. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and we, we do things like reducing everything to a case, removing numbers, this sort of thing. Then we go and take our dictionary and identify bigrams. So here we found inflation increasing, we found lower labour demand, and we found unemployment rising. And then we calculate a score, in this case just for the snippet, but in reality for the whole text. So we count one hawkish, one to something that would cause you to tighten, in this case increasing inflation, and two dovish, things that would cause you to loosen, lower labour demand, unemployment rising. And that leads us to a sentiment score. A few items on text preparation. Um, one question clearly is what to include. Um, for speeches, we include pretty much everything, excluding charts and tables and things like that. For minutes, the most important bit is we remove the decision section. So the bit that says, um, Therefore, we have decided to raise rates by a half a percent. Otherwise, that's going to give us a rather false, strong indicator. Um, constructing our dictionary, compared to other studies, we use a larger dictionary simply because speeches versus minutes are much more varied in their language. Um, how we constructed this was really to identify policy keywords that we're interested in, find all the words co occurring with those, and then select those which give a direction of change. So higher, lower, we're avoiding ambiguous words here. So for example, growth, that could mean economic growth, or it could mean growth in unemployment. So we ignore that. Uh, we deal with some other small things like multi-word phrases, to confirm we're looking for changes, not levels. And we also spend time removing um, non-affecting stop words. So these are words which are could be interposing within our bigrams, but which don't really make make a difference to the tone of the uh, of the statement. So unemployment is rising, for example, we can simply get rid of the is and identify unemployment and rising together. Now this has to be done with care and there's much more detail in the paper, but what we don't want to remove is things which would change the statement, for example, but, except, and not cross sentence boundaries. We also get rid of negatives completely. So any sentences that have negatives in, these are very, very hard to interpret correctly. So we simply get rid of them. So how do our measures perform? Um, we've got a, uh, firstly an eyeball here of the minute sentiment versus the vote, and we can see some decent co-movement. It's a reasonably kind of decent sanity check. Adding in speeches, we can see again that they move 
fairly well in line. Um, there's much more variation, and you can see that from the range. Um, as individual speakers don't speak often enough, we have to take an average of individual speakers' speeches over this time. Um, and indeed, each speech has fewer hits of uh, biograms than minutes do. This is to be expected because speeches are not dealing quite so fully and focusedly with monetary policy compared to MPC minutes. So we take our model, we take our sentiment indexes, and now let's uh, run these through an empirical analysis. Firstly, do we see any um, big connection between dissent and uncertainty? The answer is not really. Um, we can see that, say, in the very high uncertainty periods of post-crisis to 2008-9, uh, there's low dissent. But in previous periods where there are those grey bars, dissent was perfectly normal. So next, let's look at our measures um, in comparison to the simulation. Do we see an increase in the volatility of sentiment and in the dispersion of estimates? Um, we don't see any significant change in the dispersion of sentiment during periods of higher uncertainty. Um, but we do see a bit more volatility, not masses more, but a bit more, um, in the sentiment measures for both individuals and committee. Um, so that's kind of an increase in their the volatility of their estimates of the state of the economy during periods of uncertainty. We repeat the regression that we saw earlier. So playing individual uh, sentiments, so that's SIT, and committee sentiment here, SMPC, and these are now derived from our text measures rather than from the simulations. And we're interacting those with high uncertainty dummies. And um, so we can see and compare to our model. Um, so we see that from the top two lines, that both individual sentiment and MPC sentiment are important in explaining votes, and that both the interactions with high uncertainty are significant and negative. So the estimates are downweighted in uncertain times, with, in this case here, the green figure, um, individual sentiment is more downweighted. So during uncertain periods, there's less weight placed on both, but particularly less weight placed on their own view. There's a few mentions here of robustness and a few links through to other things. We've checked a number of these um, things. For example, I haven't talked here about measures of uncertainty. There's a variety of different ways you can measure uncertainty, um, but we've shown some robustness to different uncertainty measures. Um, we use a combination of consensus uncertainty and uh, FTSE 100 volatility. Uh, we also do checks for uh, times with and without financial crises, excluding more speeches where there aren't many hits, this kind of thing. But in conclusion, we find that uh, the data from the speeches and the minutes corroborate a number of predictions from our signal extraction model. Um, so both individual and committee economic sentiment measures matter in a positive way. And during uncertain times, um, both of these are downweighted. And there is no significant change in dissent during high uncertainty periods. So this kind of means that any media focus on voting record as an indicator of uncertainty um, is unreliable. And therefore, other communication methods are really important for conveying any difference in view because consensus on a committee doesn't necessarily need to imply either a lack of process and debate or a lack of uncertainty going on, simply the nature of the pass through between assessment and, uh, and vote. So I think I'll leave it there. Brilliant, um, thanks Al, that was great uh, and very timely uh, given what's been going on today. Uh, so um, we have got uh, one question. Remember to use the Q&A button at the bottom uh, for questions and we've got about 10 minutes. So uh, Anna, did you want to uh, take the first one? Um, I have a question about the signal extraction and the uncertainty measure. So uh, First, it looks to me that you have a noise on the top of the variance of the true signal and those things cannot be correlated. So the, the issue I have in mind is the following. 
one reason why the committee members may disagree is because they have the they, they cannot they cannot uh, they have uncertainty measure of the current state of the economy that's basically what you said and one example of that is the uncertainty on on data revisions on gdp so for example in 2012 there's lots of uncertainty why you're going to have a double deep recession or not and that was a strong link with the oil estimates of gdp so in that case the signal to noise ratio is actually correlated with the uncertainty of the underlying variable because normally it's hard to measure gdp at turning points in recessions so i'm, I'm wondering if 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 your model could accommodate that and together with that question there's something else i wanted to say is that you seems to be measuring in certain periods using financial markets uh you said that your results are robust to that but but i think what you need here is is macro uncertainty and issues on measuring gdp and inflation okay so i think that's, i mean it's a really interesting comment about the uh the uh, the first point about potential linkages between the uncertainty and the um, and the measure itself, and that's something we can definitely um, have a look and see if we can deal with. Um, in terms of the uncertainty measure, so yeah, we've, the, um, the ones we're using at the moment are a combination, so we've got um, consensus uncertainty, so that is um, effectively disagreement between uh, the members of the consensus panel um, of economic forecasters, um, so that's less of a uh, sort of it's hard. a forecasting uncertainty, right? So it's not about the current. It's true that the MPC members might make decisions taking in account a certain about future values of GDP inflation, not current values. But 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 what I'm trying to say is that um, it might be that, for example, the, the, the bank does publish these measures of data uncertain of GDP, right? And and they do vary over time in a kind of subjective way. Um, but but it, I, I think it has a, a point, a, a issue there that, that would be nice to consider. Okay. Yeah, that's great. I think financial and macro uncertain are quite different. That, that, that's another thing I want to emphasize too. Yes, absolutely. So, 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 so the forecasters is, is macro uncertainty. I agree with you in that point. But the, the financial markets it, it, it is, is quite different from, from forecaster uncertainty. Yes. Um, it's a yeah, it's a slightly thorny topic of picking a good uncertainty measure or some good uncertainty measures, uh, given which which areas they do in, in, in sort of past periods where we'd look at it and go, well, surely that bit was in a certain measure. Which ones the financial markets pick out and which ones the other macro ones yeah. are quite different. I, I absolutely agree with you. I was really worried that the 2012 is not a period of high uncertainty in your plot, I think. and. And, and, and policy that year was really, really, really complicated. Sure. So, I mean, I, this is why we already, why we combined two. So uh, I'll um, definitely take that point. It's really uh, a really interesting one. Thanks. Thank you. That's a really good point that uh, Anna's made. And I was going to say something similar, much less eloquently. Um, so um, moving on to another question from Craig McLaren at the ONS. Unfortunately, uh, Craig doesn't have a mic on his laptop. Um, but uh, he says, fantastic, uh, fascinating piece of work and analysis, Al. Um, and he was asking whether and how you dealt with the change in the makeup of the MPC uh, over time. Sure. So um, aside from one very short period, um, there are, remain nine members. Um, we don't track individual members um, in terms of sort of bringing out specific time series for each member. Um, but we do include member-specific fixed effects. Um, so hidden in that regression there um, was, a, I think, an alpha I um, that included a whole bunch of fixed effects for, um, for specific members. Um, those are both just a kind of a general, a general catch-all, but particularly around things like uh, whether they're the governor or not, which governor they are under, um, and, yeah, a few other items in there. So that's mainly how we, how we pick up, because agreed that any given... Uh, member almost by definition and by design should have different views they'll start at different baselines and indeed they'll communicate in different ways so the language used by one member and another will be entirely different so we have to kind of allow for that and treat them differently um, in terms of the actual language feed through we kind of amalgamate this all together so we assume that usage by one member and usage by another will involve the same superset of words um, we don't individually weight each uh, each mention. It's just a yes or a no in terms of hawkish or dovish mention. 
Um, but by allowing the fixed effects, then hopefully that means we um, uh, we don't just completely downweight those who are less voluble or less florid in their language, say, than others. Um, I'm not sure if we lost Arthur at this stage. Just in case we have lost Arthur, there's another question here from Charlotte Meng. Let me just uh, unmute her. Well, yeah. I'm having a few connection issues here, uh, but we do, if I'm back, then we do have uh, just maybe time for, for another question or two. That's um, right. We've just invited Charlotte to speak her question. Sorry, you, didn't, you don't really need me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, hello. Hi. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, this is Charlotte from ESCO. Um, yes, very interesting work. Uh, and my question is quite technical. Uh, I see when you clean the data, the transcripts, you removed numbers. I just wonder, um, is it possible to incorporate this in your sentiment analysis? Because um, intuitively, like a growth of 4% and 8% would convey different level of sentiment. So I think probably if it is possible to include numbers, um, the precision of your uh, sentiment analysis might be improved. So that's a really interesting question. Um, and I absolutely agree with you that if we could do that, that would be great. My first instinct is that, particularly using the types of mechanisms we're using, that that would be very hard to get the numbers in context. So um, this is all about finding not just, say, references to higher or lower, but references to higher and lower with respect to a particular item. Um, so being able to absolutely identify that someone is referencing higher by 4% and that those items all clump together um, will be tough. I think that at that stage we're looking much more like a sort of manual process for identifying these statements um, and at that point we could really get I'm sure a lot of value but with 900 odd speeches and uh, 250 odd minutes um, this is perhaps a slightly daunting uh, challenge to try to identify the linkage between the number and what it refers to. Um, mm. But I, I definitely agree with you that this would be great because we could add a lot more quanti quantification to statements where they do make reference to numbers. Mm. Is, is it possible to use sentence boundaries to tie a number to a specific content? Uh, yeah, potentially, absolutely. And we already do use sentence boundaries to make sure we don't drift across um, mm. in terms of the uh, effectively the adjective and the noun. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, you're right, absolutely, we may be able to do that. We'd also need to be super careful with the way we clean things out because there are a number of other things where, for example, a speech has a chart embedded in it and we need to make sure that we don't erroneously pick up um, numbers from those charts. But yeah, mm -hmm. that's a really interesting uh, observation, thank you. Okay, thanks. Just in case we've lost Arthur again, um, just to say if somebody uh, has their hand raised, please could you type your question in the Q&A box rather than raising your hand if you have a question. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. I'm briefly back, um, just in time, hopefully, to uh, introduce Eric. Um, although I'm still having some problems, uh, so I might just go and try and sort out my internet in a second. Uh, but Eric, if you're happy to start now and can hear me, um, you've got 20 minutes to chat and then uh, 10 minutes to Q&A. If there's time at the end, then we'll have a bit more of a, a general discussion, um, depending on how the questions go. Thanks. Thank you, Arthur. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Falchuk, and I'm the research data scientist at the Bank of England. Uh, the usual disclaimer applies here, so the views for this presentation, this presentation are 
uh, the authors and do not necessarily reflect those of the Bank of England or its policy committees. So this presentation is based mostly on, on the staff working paper which we published last year. And all, of, all my co-authors are the bank and their researchers and policy specialists. Um, and uh, let me start with, with explaining the motivation for, for, this, for this particular research. So we wanted to, to understand, to create new ways to, to measure complexity. And uh, we then use these measures to understand how, how do UK banking regulations changed after the great financial crisis. So I'll, I'll briefly talk you through, through the timing. I'll give you a very brief summary, and then I'll go into, into detail. So we know that um, regulations create costs, and there are different types of, of costs. Opportunity costs, compliance costs, and cognitive costs. In, in this paper, we focus on, on cognitive costs, uh, which are related to complexity, which, which we mentioned as well. So a cognitive cost uh, um, related to understanding what is uh, what is actually required. Uh, so cognitive costs are an example of, of cognitive costs would be reading rules, which are which are complicated to, to understand, for example. And so we don't focus here on uh, on, on compliance costs or on um, opportunity costs. So just I just wanted to make this clear at the beginning. Um, so why did we actually conduct a textual analysis of rules? So one of the reasons is because rules are, um, are, are actually in text. So in text is, is data. And we, we have quite a lot of this um, data on our website, on PDFs. So this information is readily available. And um, it can be then analyzed using natural language processing methods that allows us to analyze large, um, large text as, as data. We use different types of measures, so measures of cognitive costs, um, which are based on psycholinguistics and computational linguistics. So measures from psycholinguistics tell us about how people process language, for example, concepts or operations, so how many different concepts there are in, in the text, how many different operations there are in, in, in a given text as well. Measures from computational linguistics capture language processing costs. So it's information about um, length of text or, or types of words which are, which are used. So in, in this paper, we, we wanted to expand this um, measurement of complexity to go beyond just uh, simple measuring of length, but we started with, with measuring the length of the regulations. So we used two points in time, 2007 and 2017, to, to measure the regulations. And um, as I mentioned, the first point was just to look at, at the volume of, uh, of the rules, the number of words. And, and we noticed that the, the volume increased, uh, increased quite a lot, from 400,000 words to 700 thousand words. And we also um, know that there are now more sources of, of the rules. So, so rules are not coming just from, from the FSA handbook, as, as they were in 2007. This is the start of silence here. But the rules are also coming from, um, from external uh, bodies, rules which are, which are directly binding. So capital requirement regulations, CRR, and also technical standards um, from EBA, European Banking Authority. So the, the high level the overview would be that, that there are more rules. So the rules are longer, but this is not necessarily um, telling you the whole story. And uh, the increase in rules also um, means that certain topics are now covered, topics that were not covered. So uh, it, it's not necessarily the increasing length of rules does not necessarily mean that the the rules are, are more complicated. So <clears throat> to, to summarize what briefly what we found in um, in this in this paper, we uh, we looked at, at how the entire network of rules changed, and we noticed that the, the core of rules um, emerges um, in 2017. Uh, we also noticed that the, the legal style, the, the style in which the rules are written, 
limit the complexity of language, so the rules are written in, in a fairly similar way. And uh, we know that at least one third of rules contain vague terms, terms like adequate, which require interpretation. And we also validated our measures using EBA questions and answer and, and a case study on definition of capital. So here I'm going to talk to you only about the first um, validation, so questions and, and answers. Okay, so now I'll go into detail. I'll talk you through um, data, I'll start with data that we use here, and then I'll talk about measures. Um, well, the, the so what, uh, so what happened after, after the, the crisis, and I'll also tell you a bit more about what this information can, can lead to, so the new, new um, strand of work on machine-readable rules, and I will finish uh, with, with conclusions. So we had several objectives for this data set. So we wanted to create a data set that's comprehensive, especially for the post-crisis 2017 uh, period, and we wanted to capture all financial regulations which apply directly to UK banks, and also supporting guidance. So we had to make some choices about what to include, what, what not to include. We also made the data set comparable uh, pre and post crisis. So that re requires a bit of uh, matching of, of the regulations. We wanted to capture rules which, which are uh, equivalent. And we also wanted to facilitate network analysis. So we also wanted to create a, to create a data set which will enable us to look at the structure of, of the regulations, not only at the text. So that's, um, that's, that's what we um, did here. And um, we used several data sources, so, and we also acquired the data in, in several ways. So the, the first place for us to start was the PRA, Prudential Regulation Authority website, um, which, which uh, we scraped and we created a tabular data set. We also extracted information from, from PDFs, so information like supervisory statements, uh, stored originally only in, in, in PDFs, and we had to create a tabular data. We also extracted links. So an example of a link be between different regulations is um, visible on, on this slide. So here on the right-hand side, you can see a link to, uh, to rule 4.2. So here you can see that rule 1.1, the one that's highlighted, uh, the, the, the orange, uh, mentions rule 4.2. So, so this is an example of, uh, of this network structure. So you can think of rule 1.1 being a node, one element, and rule 4.2 being another element. And connection between them is this mention of rule 4.2 in rule 1.1. So, so that's how we uh, generated this uh, network measure. Um, you can see other examples on, on the bottom of this slide. So here I can, I'm showing you capital requirement regulations. So that's, um, that's the EBA rulebook, which, uh, which we also scraped and uh, turned into a tabular data set. Um, this uh, data creation was mostly automated, but also required some judgment and, and had some research assistance. Code for, for generating data set, PRA rulebook data set, is publicly available on Bank of England's um, GitHub. So code to repository uh, enables it anyone to, to look into this, this data, this part of data set that we used here, and uh, to conduct additional analysis. So please go ahead and, uh, and see what you can find anything, uh, anything, anything interesting uh, there. Okay, so now I'll move to measures. So we used um, several measures coming from, from different um, measures which were inspired by, by different disciplines. So we started with linguistic measures, so measures like lexical diversity, conditionality, and length. So length is probably the most commonly used measure. So this is just the number of words. Um, we also use lexical diversity, so relative frequency of unique words. So we looked at how many new words uh, appear in, in different regulations. And that tells you about you know, how many new concepts there are, which, which is a cognitive cost. We also looked at conditionality, so relative frequency of conditional statements like if, but, uh, which tells you about um, cognitive cost of operations. So if you have a long list of conditional statements, so 
for example, if else then, if else then, this kind of rule is quite hard to understand, or much harder to understand that, that rules that don't have these conditional statements. And, and these measures capture local complexity, uh, so cognitive costs which are incurred while a person reads a rule. We also have several measures um, from network science, so measures like degree, which is the most um, the simplest measure, I think, to, to um, calculate number of direct cross-references. So here, uh, both um, cross-references to a rule and from a rule, uh, which tell you, tell you about centrality uh, or context, depending whether this link is from a rule or to a rule. We also look at the page rank. Uh, so that's the famous Google algorithm, which tells you about the chain of cross-references leading to a rule uh, weighted by their importance. And we also used a reverse page rank, which is a chain of cross references starting from a rule and weighted by, by their importance. And another set of measures came from, uh, from, from legal research, from, from law. So here the measures um, we used were, were the following. So vagueness was the first one, so that is the ratio of very vague terms. Terms like reasonable or adequate, which require interpretation. And um, we also look at the number of precise, um, precise words assigned, so things like um, percentage or, 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 or GDP, uh, which, which tell you about particular uh, thresholds. So, so these, are, these measures capture different types of global complexity, so complexity that uh, require additional information which is available in, in the rulebook. So we decided that we also had to validate this measure. So we not only calculated this measure, so um, above the, more than, than just creating descriptive rules, we also um, wanted to make sure that the, the measures uh, are valid. And we did that by looking at the questions and answers which are asked at the EBA website. The European Banking Authority um, collects the, questions and answers uh, where, where banks and others can submit clarifying questions about different parts of, um, of CRR, capital requirement regulations. So um, we, we used uh, these uh, rules and, and we checked which rules actually have questions asked about them. And uh, we fitted uh, a model, logistic regression uh, model. Uh, on the left hand side, we had information whether a question was asked or not asked about a particular rule. And on the right hand side, we use our complexity measures and uh, we also controlled um, for, for, for topics and non cognitive costs. We used the sample of um, 1400 QAs, which were related to 260 CRR articles, but we also looked at articles that did not have questions asked about them. And, um, Using, using this um, approach, we were able to, to find that the centrality, the network measures were, were highly predictive of uh, asking questions. Uh, precise rules um, uh, also led to a high number of um, well, high probability of asking questions. And so, so was the number of total, total sentences or unique tokens. So, so here we can see coefficient and uh, and um, confidence interval on this slide. So, <clears throat> so this is one way of, for us to, to validate our, our measures, which, which we think we, we succeeded in, in doing. Um, then we use the measures to actually apply, to, to answer the questions about post-crisis reform. So um, we, we wanted to, to understand what's changed after, after the crisis, so in this 10-year span. So uh, let me just start with, with showing you a table with the descriptives. Um, so we, we look at the number of words, uh, unique words, and conditional words in the regulation, and, and we can see that all of them, all of them increased, whether that was uh, rules or guidance. And we also look at, at this um, uh, network measures, which also increased. So the number of uh, of nodes, so provisions, and also number of edges cross-references in increased. So, so we know that now we, we, can, we can give a precise number on, on the change of um, regulation.
regulation. So we know that post reform regulation is longer, it contains more concepts and more operation. It contains more rules and more cross references. So, so that's, that's one way to, to understand this change. Um, you can also um, look at, uh, at what precisely changed, which part of, um, of linguistic measures changed. Uh, so here you can see different deciles. Uh, so we split measures of length, flex, or diversity into, into, uh, into deciles, and we look at what changed. And it looks like the, the most um, complex um, rules became even more complex. So the rules in the in the top deciles become became even even more complex. So, um, but overall legal style, so the style in which rules are written, ensure that linguistic complexity was uh, was contained and that this change was uh, was contained only in, in small in small pockets. So I think the, the next point you know, shows you very well the change on the on, in the structure of regulation. So here you can see different types of um, regulation in colors uh, and how the, the entire structure of regulation changed from 2007 to 2017. So um, as I mentioned previously when I showed you the table, now we have more rules and more interconnection. But I, I think that this, this change in structure is clearly visible on, on the network chart, which, which shows you here that in 2007 there, there was just one source of um, of regulation, so that was the rule book, really, which included um, other regulations as well, so incorporated them. But in 2007, uh, some regulations were, were separated and other regulations were, were added. So here, that, that shows you the, the different colors. And the central part is the CRR, the capital requirements regulation, which are the most connected and uh, are the most central part of, of, this, of this network. So I, I think that uh, this picture is really worth a thousand words because it shows you very well how, um, how this complexity changed. Um, so here are the, the, plot, the similar plots that I showed you previously with the different deciles. So again, network um, complexity, centrality, and context changed mostly in, in the plot deciles. Um, so where does it lead us? It, it could potentially lead us to, um, to standard research on machine readable rules, which is a follow-up study which we currently uh, work on. And also this is something that the bank and the FCA works on. And we thought that this research can potentially contribute to this kind of research. So um, we know that um, traditional solution to re regulatory complexity is simplification. Um, but um, law also requires interpretation, so not everything can be simplified because super supervision requires discretion. Um, and uh, certain concepts are, are just vague, so words like adequate, others are specific. But we wanted to map the, the concepts or, or rules which uh, fit into, into different groups, so uh, certain regulations which can be simplified, or others which, which cannot. Uh, so we looked at the distribution of vague and precise terms across the regulation, and, uh, and we found that um, vague terms are fairly common, uh, where specific numerical values are, are not. Uh, we were also able to, to um, put rules on this, on this particular plot, which shows you about uh, so relative conditionality on x-axis and vagueness on, on y-axis, and uh, using these measures we could um, potentially in, in, in follow-up studies could identify rules which might require substantial interpretation uh, or rules which do not require interpretation. So, so we think that this is a very nice follow-up or potential application of, uh, of these uh, of, of our current findings. But uh, uh, I think I will just uh, conclude now. Um, so to summarize, we use textual analysis to measure post-crisis increase in complexity. We found that um, now the regulation is, is, is larger, the rules are, the, the regulation is larger and more interconnected, but language of individual rules did not become more complex. And we developed an approach to identify where machine-readable rules could succeed. 
and we created new data set uh, which can be used for, for different purposes. And um, if you want to find out more about this information, please go ahead and read our staff working paper. We're also preparing a journal article which should be available soon. And if you have uh, further questions, please ask them now or feel free to contact me after the presentation. Thank you very much. A lot of them was uh, really interesting. Uh, so we just got a minute now for questions, and then it's the end of the session as a whole. Um, so what I'm going to say is um, please post any questions that you've got uh, for Eric about this paper. Um, but also any other questions that you'd like to send to authors uh, about their papers or about this kind of field in general of machine learning, natural language processing, connections with their policy. Um, and we can have a bit more of a discussion. I can see we haven't got any questions so far, uh, Eric, so um, I, might, I might ask you one. Uh, is, is there any way to say, you know, when the complexity is necessary or not? Is there for a reason? So, um, you know, do we know when the cost of the counterfactual of having simpler uh, rules uh, would be kind of uh, worth it and when they wouldn't? That's a very good question, I think. So, we, we are not saying in, in this paper that um, complexity is necessarily bad. So, we, what we are saying is that. There is increase in in, uh, in effort you might uh, you might require to understand certain rules, but the, the purpose really uh, of this complexity, uh, well, the complex complexity might be an unintended consequence of uh, improving the regulation. Um, so, so just because the rules became more complex, it, it is not necessarily uh, it's not necessarily negative. But in, we believe that in some cases things could be simpler and we wanted to map these cases and potentially show a way in which complexity or cognitive complexity at least could be could be decreased. So so there are different levels of looking at complexity of understanding complexity. So as I, as I mentioned um, previously this, this complexity can, can lead to different types of costs, but complexity can be related not only to this um, well Cognitive, really, or, or, or linguistic complexity, for example, structural complexity, but also complexity of uh, of concepts. So, if the financial system is, is very complicated, so uh, understandably, the rules themselves will be complicated as well. I, I hope that answers your question, Arthur. Unfortunately, I dropped out slightly in the middle, um, but I hope I didn't get all of it. But I, I got the gist. Um, thank you for uh, answering. Uh, does anyone uh, else want to ask a question about the paper or the, the general area? Arthur, we can't really hear you. Could you speak closer to the microphone? Um, I was just saying, uh, so anyone else got any other questions uh, for Eric or for any of the other presenters in the session? Um, I, I just want to say, uh, while no one's coming up with questions, uh, that it's a really exciting time uh, to be working at the interface of natural language processing and machine learning because uh, there's some exciting uh, work going on. And I feel like we've only really scratched the surface uh, so far. All right, well, I'm not sure if I've lost you. I'm back, great. Okay. Um, well, listen, if there are no more uh, questions, then I, I propose, uh, or no one wants to say anything, um, then I propose uh, that we close a bit early, uh, give people a bit of a break for the next session. I do just want to advertise that if you're interested in natural processing, then um, tomorrow morning there is a session on job vacancies uh, that involves some NLP as well, uh, which is chaired by David Rosenfeld, uh, which you might want to check out. Full disclosure, my co-author is presenting one of our papers there, uh, so this is not a selfless advertisement. 
And just another reminder again about that Bank of England, uh, Federal Reserve and uh, King's College London Conference on Big Data and Machine Learning, deadline 21st of September. Uh, more details on the banking website. Thanks everyone for participating uh, in this session and thank you especially to the presenters uh, for presenting such uh, exciting work and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>